Vemostenes howls at the sea. Imagine that instead of being able to say Great Britain, Russia, or Brazil, you could only say Great Britain, Russia, or Brazil. Would it surprise you very much if silly people laughed at you? Would it surprise you very much if silly people laughed at you? This speech impediment is called rothicism, and it makes us, even though we are adults, sound like children under five. Would you believe that the man who became the greatest and most influential public speaker in the ancient world suffered from it? The Mostanes lived in Athens from 384 to 322 BC, in the very same days when titans like Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, and the great dramatists walked in the streets of that city. Essay, I bumped into Sophocles at the supermarket. Oh, really? Well, I just saw Euripides queuing at the petrol station. <laughs> Those were the kind of amazing encounters you could have in Athens in those days. Demosthenes became an orphan at the age of seven. Although his father left him a vast fortune, his world fell apart. The three men assigned as his guardians took advantage of his weakness, belittled him, humiliated him, stole from him for years without Demosthenes being able to do anything to defend himself. Like Cinderella... He grew up humiliated and exploited by the parasites around him. Likely, he was even sexually abused because pedophilia was widespread in Greece at the time. He was physically weak and could not, therefore, receive the education that other Athenian children received in the gymnasium. He never excelled in athletics and sports, as young Greeks were so fond of doing. As a child who had suffered years of humiliation, loneliness, and abuse, and who, to top it all, pronounced all his R's as L's, becoming a public speaker was the last thing that should have been required of Demosthenes. But that was precisely what was demanded from Demosthenes. When he finally reached the age of 18, he sued his guardians, but he had to stand before an assembly that was easily swayed by the rhetorical ability and the compelling voice with which one party or the other made their case. In Athens, every citizen had to represent himself, so the Mosthenes had to become a great speaker to save his fortune, his pride, and his future. This is what first pushed him to train his voice, and he did it so well that he became the greatest public speaker in antiquity, and even the legendary Cicero deferred to him. The historian Plutarch tells us that the first time the Mosthenes tried to speak in public, people laughed at him, because his style was too crude and his sentences too long and clumsy. He would interrupt and fragment his complicated and tedious arguments simply because he ran out of breath. So Demosthenes created a training program worthy of a Shaolin monk to improve his voice and his delivery. 1. He built or adapted himself an underground studio to practice out of the mocking gaze of others. And imagine this. He shaved half his head to look so ridiculous that he would be ashamed to leave that studio before he had practiced for weeks until his hair grew back. 2. Then he began to go to the theater to study other public speakers and learn from them. Plutarch says it was his custom to sit up at night and review the conversations and speeches he had heard during the day considering what other answers or arguments might have been presented in each case. 3. To improve his diction, he began to recite passages in front of a mirror with a mouth full of pebbles. Please do not try this at home. You will choke. If you want to improve your diction, just bite lightly on a pencil, your finger, or a piece of cork and read aloud like that, 
and your diction will improve dramatically. 4. To improve his stamina and breath control, he recited his speeches aloud while running through the countryside. <laughs> that must have been quite a sight. Hey, there's that weirdo de Mostenes again. And guess what? He's running on the countryside, talking to himself. <laughs> Five. To enhance his volume and projection, the Mostenes would go down to the beach and howl his speech and his pain and frustration, surely, at the sea until his voice could be heard clearly above the wind and the waves. Demosthenes won his case against his tutors, though in the end he only received a fraction of his father's estate. But the treasure he won in the process was more significant and valuable than his original inheritance. He lived out the rest of his days admired and celebrated by all those who had mocked him as a youth. His speeches were so persuasive that other people began to pay him to write theirs, and thus the Mustanes practically invented the role of the defense attorney. His influence grew to the point that during the last 30 years of his life, he was the great leader of Athens and the rest of Greece against the incursion and tyranny of Philip II of Macedonia and his son, the invincible, legendary Alexander the Great. And it was precisely while the soldiers of Alexander's successor, Antipater, were pursuing him that Demosthenes had to flee Athens and decided to commit suicide by taking poison rather than falling into their hands. Let me read for you a few paragraphs from one of his most famous orations, the Third Philippic, his third discourse to the Athenian assembly, trying to move them to action to avoid being enslaved by Philip in the year 341 B.C. It is considered a masterpiece of rhetoric, written to encourage the men of his city to fight against the coming tyranny. And bear in mind that the Mostenes would pay for this with his life. Many speeches are made, men of Athens, at almost every meeting of the assembly. With reference to the aggressions which Philip has been committing, ever since he concluded the peace, not only against yourselves, but against all other peoples. And I am sure that all would agree, however little they may act on their belief, that our aim, both in speech and in action, should be to cause him to cease from his insolence and to pay the penalty for it. And yet I see that in fact the treacherous sacrifice of our interests has gone on until what seems an ill omen saying may, I fear, be really true. That if all who came forward desire to propose and you desire to carry the measures which would make your position as pitiful as it could possibly be, it could not, so I believe, be made worse than it is now. Consider the matter in this light. In every other sphere of life, you believe that the right of free speech ought to be so universally shared by all who are in the city that you have extended it both to foreigners and to slaves. And one may see many a servant in Athens speaking his mind with greater liberty than is granted to citizens in some other states. But from the sphere of political counsel, you have utterly banished this liberty. The result is that in your meetings, you give yourself airs and enjoy their flattery, listening to nothing but what is meant to please you, while in the world of facts and events, you are in the last extremity of peril. If then you are still in this mood today, I do not know what I can say. But if you are willing to listen while I tell you without flattery what your interest requires, I am prepared to speak. For though our position is very bad indeed, and much has been sacrificed already, it is still possible, even now, if you will do your duty to set everything right once more. It is a strange thing, perhaps, 
that I am about to say, but it is true. The worst feature in the past is that in which lies our best hope for the future. And what is this? It is that you are in your present plight because you do not do any part of your duty, small or great. For of course, if you were doing all that you should do and were still in this evil case, you could not even hope for any improvement. As it is, Philip has conquered your indolence and your indifference, but he has not conquered Athens. You have not been vanquished. You have never even stirred. So long as the vessel is safe, be it great or small, so long must the sailor and the pilot and every man in his place exert himself and take care that no one may capsize it by design or by accident. But when the seas have overwhelmed it, all their efforts are in vain. So it is, men of Athens, with us. While we are still safe, with our great city, our vast resources, our noble name, what are we to do? We ourselves, in the first place, must conduct the resistance and make preparation for it with ships, that is, and money, and soldiers. For though all but ourselves give way and become slaves, we, at least, must contend for freedom. That is the policy for a city with a reputation such as yours. The task is yours. It is the prerogative that your forefathers won and through many a great peril bequeath to you. But if each of you is to sit and consult his inclinations, looking for some way by which he may escape any personal action, the first consequence will be that you will never find anyone who will act on your behalf. And the second, I fear, that the day will come when we shall be forced to do at one at the same time all the things we wish to avoid. If the proposal is carried out, I think that even now the state of our affairs may be remedied. But if anyone has a better proposal to make, let him make it and give us his advice. And I pray to all the gods that whatever be the decision that you are about to make, it may be for your good. The orphan boy, abused and robbed for years by his guardians, mocked by all as a teenager, ended up becoming the brave defender and leader of Athens and the rest of Greece against the military invasion of the Macedonians. He had in those days more influence and widespread respect than his contemporaries Plato and Aristotle, whom he indeed must have met in person, though I fear they would not have liked each other, because Demosthenes died defending democracy, a form of government that never quite convinced either Plato or Aristotle. This could be the subject of another episode in the future. Leave me a comment to tell me if you'd be interested in learning more about this mistrust of democracy from some of the greatest thinkers of Athens. Vermostenes suffered constant abuse as a child and teenager and was so miserably lonely that he took to going to the sea to cry out his sorrows and frustration because no one else would listen to him. But he learned the art of influencing and inspiring others better than anyone else, not with his power or his money, as George Soros does today, but with his actions, his example, and his words. When the Mostenes addressed the crowd, he knew what details to choose or omit, when to be accessible and straightforward, and when to be elegant and elaborate to strengthen his case. Every principle he defended in the public arena was congruent with his conscience, an echo of his own identity, and he refused to comment on any subject that he had not studied in detail. Did you hear that, Hollywood stars? The Mostenes is the admirable grandfather of all those who, like me, have the privilege of being voice professionals, and how much we can still learn from him. So, if you're interested in developing your communication skills, this is... 
the Demosthenes method to influence and inspire others in the public arena. One, practice the art of communication, which is your most valuable social skill away from the mocking gaze of others. Two, listen to other professionals in your field and learn all you can from each one of them. Three, constantly improve your diction and enunciation, i.e. your ability to speak clearly and persuasively. Learn to give weight to every word and every gesture. Four, improve the projection and volume of your voice. Take voice lessons, and why not singing lessons? Five, take good care of yourself and improve your physical condition and breath control. Your breath is fundamental. Learn to breathe well, to breathe better. Six, overcome the mockery of idle people. And every now and then. Seven, escape to the beach and hide all your sorrows and secrets at the sea. Thank you for listening. I'm Gabriel Porras, professional voiceover artist. Visit me at gabrielvoice.com and at radiantwhispers.com and let's go howl at the sea together. <laughs>